Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to this seminar. We will begin our seminar now. First of all, let me invite our Dean from Hong Kong Academy of Finance, Mr. Guo Guo Chen, to deliver welcome remarks, please. Guests, Dr. Guan, Professor Huang, online friends, good afternoon. Welcome to this seminar jointly organized by the Hong Kong Academy of Finance and Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Research. Today, we are very honored to have Dr. Guan Tao and Professor Huang Yiping with us to discuss RMB exchange rates formation mechanism and exchange rates outlook. Dr. Guan, right now, is the Global Chief Economist and Managing Director of BOCI. He has been the spokesperson of SAFE and also the Director of International Receipts and Payments. He is a participant and witness of China's foreign exchange uh, reform system and over a long period of time in relation to China's uh, foreign exchange system policies and exchange rate trend, uh, he has in-depth uh, research. Professor Wang Yiping is now the um, Professor of Economics and Finance in National School of Development of Peking University. He's also the Associate Dean, and he is also the um, uh, head of Peking University uh, Digital Finance Research Center. In 2015, June to 2018, June, Professor Huang uh, was a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of PBOC. Dr. Guan and Professor Huang are now meeting with us through video conferencing from P uh, Beijing. And in Hong Kong, we are very honored to have 40 guests on site to participate in this webinar. So all guests here are experts in the Chinese economy and RMB exchange rate, or senior leaders and senior executives of various financial institutions. So today, this room is filled with friends. This is a very valuable opportunity. We hope that there will be keen participation and uh, questions. This event is one of the expert series talks organized by Hong Kong Academy of Finance and Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Research will continue to organize similar events so that there can be in-depth discussion about matters um, related to the Chinese economy. We hope that experts, scholars, senior executives and leaders can make good use of this platform to share your research findings and insights. And we hope that online participants will continue to take part in our events. Finally, all the viewpoints and discussion done within this seminar represent only the perspectives of guests, and they do not represent the views of any organization. Now I will pass the floor to Dr. Guan Tao and Professor Huang Yipin to start their conversation, please. Thank you, Mr. Guo. Today, I'm very happy to join this seminar jointly organized by the Hong Kong AOF and Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Research. I'm happy to be here with Professor Huang to do this discussion. Right now, I'm in the hotel because of the pandemic. I am still in quarantine. So you can see this background of the hotel. So in such an environment, I think uh, it is particularly uh, meaningful to talk about uh, RMB exchange rates. In 1998, I studied in Australia and Professor Huang taught me international economics. So today, if uh, my discussion was not of good quality, well, uh, it uh, was not because of uh, anything wrong done by Professor Huang. Thank you, Professor. Oh, it is so nice of you, Dr. Guan. I think you all know that Dr. 
Guan is very proficient in exchange rate policy. And in the past 10 years, uh, in the uh, SAFE, uh, he has assumed position and also in the market. Um, in I think he is the most authoritative and most influential expert in this area in China. So today, I'm happy to have this discussion with him together. What I need to do is to actually uh, start and stimulate discussion so that Dr. Guan can share his insights. So let's first start from the present moment. Now, Guan Tao, I think you are aware that in the past two years, our exchange rate has seen some volatility. And in fact, uh, there have been some special uh, patterns. In the first half last year, since the pandemic, well, there has been some time of depreciation. But after May, uh, the currency has been appreciating. And this year in Q1, Q2, uh, there have been some changes. So in Q1, there was some depreciation. And in Q2, appreciation started again. And after that, there were some changes. So let me ask you the first two questions. First question, in the past period, how do you interpret the volatility in the exchange rate? I think people will be more concerned about your views of uh, the exchange rate of RMB in the coming months, in the remaining months of this year. So what will be the trend of RMB? Thank you, Professor Huang, for your questions. It is true that in the past period, there was big volatility in RMB exchange rate. Before the end of May last year, RMB depreciated. Actually, the last round of depreciation started from the 811 uh, reform uh, in 2015. It has been five years already. But starting June last year, RMB started to appreciate. So it was normal appreciation. The main reasons are four points. First, uh, China's pandemic control work has been good. And number two, economic recovery was fast. And number three, the interest rate differential between U.S. and China widened. And number four, the uh, USD uh, weakened. So comparing with the end of May, RMB was up 10%. Uh, and last year, RMB appreciated around 7%. So with this backdrop, many people actually paid more attention to RMB because RMB will continue to appreciate this year. And at the end of last year and early this year, we have been telling people that uh, they should not be too simple-minded in looking at RMB exchange rates. Our judgment is that this year, RMB may not be as strong as you expect. And at this present moment, we can say that RMB exchange rate has actually proven, what, uh, proven our judgment. As of yesterday, this year, RMB has shown a W trend at the beginning of the year. RMB uh, appreciated to over 6.5, but in March, it fell um, below 6.5. And within one month of, month of March, uh, all the appreciation, all the rise had uh, been offset. And then in April and May, there was appreciation. In the end of May and early June, there was uh, sharp rise and at that time RMB exceeded 6.4 reaching 6.36 so it is a new high in the past three years but then after June it began to fall at the end of July because of some incidents there was a short-term fall to below 6.5 so this year why is it that there are uh, these shocks in RMB exchange rates. But this year, when we thought about uh, the trend of RMB exchange rate, there is an important logic. Actually, exchange rate is a price comparison between two currencies. So if you judge a certain currency's exchange rate, you should not only look at things happening in China. You need to look at what is happening in the US and other countries. So if you need to uh, judge about exchange rate of RMB, this is an important logic. Last year, in the second half, RMB exchange rate strengthened. So all, first of all, there is good pandemic control. Number two, economic base. Number three, interest rate differential between China and U.S. Number four, USD trend. All these favorable factors uh, led to the appreciation of RMB. And this year, if we think of the exchange rate trend, 
we should not only look at these four favorable factors to come to a judgment about exchange rate trend, because exchange rate is the comparison between two currencies, so we have to pay attention to changes in overseas as well. Early this year, we said that there are seven uncertainties that will affect RMB exchange rate. Apart from the four factors mentioned above, there are three other factors. First, export uh, expectation or outlook. Number two, financial risk. And number three, uh, relationship between big countries. This year, uh, you have seen the dual uh, or two-way shocks in RMB. Well, three out of the seven factors have undergone some changes. First, USD index. Last year, USD weakened. Many people thought that USD would continue to weaken, but then in Q1 this year, USD rebounded. At the beginning of the year, it came below 90, but in first quarter, it rose through 93. So as a result, uh, there was some support to RMB. Second, for 10-year US Treasury yield, at the end of last year, no more than 1%, but then this year in March, it ro rose over 1.7% as a result. The interest rate differential or spread between US and China, USD and uh, RMB, was uh, such that there was a negative uh, or opposite direction impact. And then the result is also some shocks in the financial markets. At the end of uh, March, there was sharp correction in U.S. equities, and then in some emerging markets, uh, there was tapering uh, concern. So now with Bond Connect, the northbound funds in the past 12 years, for the first time, uh, flowed into RMB bonds. So at the end of last year, people did not think that these will happen. But then in Q1 this year, these really happened as a result. There was opposite direction uh, correction, and that's because of market force. And into Q2, the three factors that I mentioned just now had uh, seen volatility. So USD index weakened, and then the yield uh, fell for a US Treasury. And then the uh, overall preference changed. So funds went back to emerging markets and risky assets. And as a result, recently R&D in April and May experienced a round of appreciation. In June and July, there was again change. So again, uh, there was a uh, rebound in USD. And so as a result, there was correction in the exchange rate between R&D and USD. So if we uh, grasp the right market logic, then we will be able to come to a more comprehensive judgment about exchange rate trend. And in the second half of this year, just now I talked about the seven uncertainties. So in the second half of the year, in the remaining months of this year, there would be dynamic uh, development and change. So in the remaining time of this year, there would be important impact on, RS, uh, on RMB. Because of time, I will not uh, go into too much detail. First of all, USD index. In the future, there would be a lot of uncertainty. At the end of last year and early this year, the market's main focus is that uh, USD will uh, fall below 80. So given that uh, basis, so people think that RMB will rise through six, but then in Q1, USD rebounded. It did not fall, it did not uh, fall continuously. It actually appreciated. It rose 3.6%. And so concerning future trend of USD index, the market has very different views. Now in the market, half of the people uh, still are pessimistic and another half are of the view that correction of USD has already finished and in the future there may be the possibility of a rebound. Now based on the central um, parity mechanism, well, if USD weakens, then uh, RMB will appreciate, of course. And then um, USD trend in the future will definitely influence RMB exchange rates. Number two, interest rate differential between U.S. and China, it all depends on inflation of the U.S. and also Federal Reserve's policy. Right now, people did a lot of analysis of the market and uh, 
there are different views uh, from former as well as serving officials. And if uh, USD continues to do QE, then uh, that would be negative impact on RMB exchange rate. But still, there is uncertainty here. The third factor is pandemic control. Last year, um, pandemic control, good pandemic control, um, favored RMB. And this year, there is vaccination. And because of the huge population in China and also pandemic control standards, this um, uh, leading advantage may weaken. But then uh, there is another thing. If there are virus variants and vaccination is no longer that effective, and if the pandemic continues to spread, uh, it is not certain whether it is favorable or unfavorable to RMB. Another factor is when the economy recovers in China. As you all know, in recent period, the Chinese government said that they want to do a good job about macro policies for this year and next year, and uh, they would like to uh, do some coordination of economic growth for second half of last year. So in the second half, the uh, fall in China's economy may be a test to China. So, so whether it is going to be an upward moving L shape or opposite. So if it is on the uh, vertical axis of L, the L shape, then uh, it is not good for RMB. So there is a lot of uncertainty. So things are different from last year. In the second half of last year, there are four favorable factors together pushing up RMB. And uh, just now I talked about a number of factors. Some may be favorable, some are not. So which factors are more dominant? This is uncertain. I personally think that at present, concerning RMB exchange rate in the second half, well, that will be two-way uh, volatility. That will be the norm. But will it be on the strong or weak side? Well, it actually depends on the exact time point, and we need to see what actually happens at that point. Right. So, uh, so that's it for the time being. Just now, Guan, Tao, Guan Tao, uh did a very complete analysis of factors affecting exchange rates. I think the analysis is very comprehensive. He also gave his own answer. In the second half, there will be two-way uh, volatility. But as I said, eventually, it is determined by different factors in the market. So a related point, just now Guang Tao emphasized that apart from domestic economy, external factors also exert big influence, influence on exchange rates. Well, if Federal Reserve changes policies, what would be the impact of RMB? At first, I wanted to ask this, but Guang Tao just now said clearly that USD and also Federal Reserve's interest rate policy will directly affect RMB. It will directly affect capital flow and also exchange rate. So what I want to ask is, um, what's your view? Now, just now you have given a uh, broad view to, um, analysis, but there is a big uncertainty. People are now discussing the rise in inflation in the US. So it seems that the Federal Reserve um, is tolerating that increase in inflation. So do you think that this is going to be a real problem or a transient problem? To what extent will Federal Reserve react to the inflation? And if they are going to react, when do you think they will do that? I'm not an expert in this regard. I think Professor Huang uh, has been examining these policies for a long time. I think uh, you uh, should be in a position to share your views, but I will share my view first. Based on the current situation, I think in the US, the inflation problem is a temporary one. It is a mismatch between demand and supply. Supply recovery lags behind demand recovery. Besides, because of the pandemic, the economy has not really restarted. And so uh, there is also a shortage of about commodities, raw material price went, uh, went up, so inflation was pushed up. If the pandemic is uh, under control, then this situation will be alleviated. So I think that the Federal Reserve is insisting on um, a loose monetary policy, that's the basis. But of course, there is a lot of uncertainty.
I remember that Xiao Chuan had said that in 1994, uh, RMB uh, depreciated and people are not surprised. And then uh, in the 811 reform, uh, there was a uh, depreciation of RMB. And in the U.S., for 30, 40 years, they have not seen high inflation. If inflation remains high in the U.S., then uh, there would be change in people's inflation expectation. Then in that case, Federal Reserve policy reaction will lag behind the market. At that time, the Fed may be forced to uh, tighten uh, monetary policy in an earlier date. That is something that the market is worried about. Now, people are of the view that the Fed in recent period may announce the uh, tapering of bond purchase, but then this may not happen this year. Perhaps it will only start to operate next year. Then the next step is a rate hike. Rate hike may happen at the end of 2021 or early 2022. So that's my view. Professor Huang, what do you think? I agree a lot with you. Basically, I agree with you. So when we look at inflation in the U.S., it is possible that it is just a temporary reaction. No matter whether you look at consumer goods or about commodities markets, well, I think the constraint on supply is more important. But right now, it is difficult to tell because in the past, when we talk about temporary inflation, usually it will be over in one to two months. You don't need to respond to it. But right now, uh, the duration may be longer. If the duration is really long, if the Fed is going to be more tolerant, if they do not respond, then what would be the consequence? I think we need to observe that. As Guan Tao said, Larry Summer, an American economist, always said that if the Fed reacts too much and at the end of the day, the consequence may be a dire one. So when it comes to Fed's policy adjustment and the impact on our exchange rate, just now, Guan Tao talked about 811 exchange rate reform. It is a reform on central parity mechanism. It is a good market-oriented uh, reform, but at the end of the day, at the end of 2015 to 2016, there was a strong round of RMB depreciation expectation, and as a result, there is outward flow of assets. And you just quoted from uh, Mr. Zhou in the past, depreciation did not cause pressure, but 811 caused a lot of problem. Now, when I look at the uh, pressure at that time, at that time, there was a similar background as now. So starting second half 2014, the Fed began to think of uh, QE. And at that time, in advanced countries, many uh, currencies also depreciated. And uh, since 811, at the end of 2014, uh, there was depreciation pressure in RMB, and if you add up these two together, well, today, when we consider the next step of Fed policy change and the impact on our exchange rate, we can also take reference from that situation. I want to ask Guan Tao a question. In second half 2015 to 2016, some effort was made, and at the end of 2016, basically, Currency depreciation expectation disappeared. There was no more pressure. And in 2017, the currency appreciated again. So in that one and a half year, there was a reverse in the exchange rate movement. So what do you think? Is it because of the central bank or the government that had done something so that the original strong depreciation expectation was reversed sharply? Professor Huang, what you said is right. At that time, after the 811 reform in China, there was a new round of uh, outflow of assets or capital. In 2015, 2016, every year there is 60 odd million USD outflow, and every year um, there is the situation. So in 2016, at the end of 2016, people talked about whether they want to protect the exchange rate or reserve, but they did not think. They did not anticipate that in 2014, there was 6% appreciation of RMB. There was no depreciation at all. And uh, there was an increase of 12 million. So why that change? I think that at that time, the authority had resolved 
the two difficulties faced by our exchange rate system after Asian financial crisis. Well, there was heated discussion about the uh, right exchange rate mechanism. So concerning managed floating uh, regime, there are two major issues. First, about transparency of market. What does that mean? Now, if you say that you want to keep the exchange rate stable, but then there is managed floating regime, so there would be both appreciation and depreciation in RMB, and the market doesn't understand why the appreciation or depreciation. Number two, policy credibility. You said you want the rate to be stable, but then when the rate appreciates or depreciates, then uh, the market does, will not understand or accept this instability. So as a result, the stable foreign exchange policy will be questioned by the market. And finally, the managed floating mechanism will collapse. At that time, we faced that situation. But then the central bank had solved the problem. In early 2016, uh, they announced the central parity mechanism with two factors, and that is the uh, closing rate of the previous day and also the basket of currency rate. So about transparency of the rate, in 2016, uh, RMB depreciate, depreciated, and in the market, there was no double um, fall in both the um, uh, stock market and bond market. And then our, uh, USD appreciated, so RMB depreciated. So the fall in exchange rate did not affect the equity market. But then there is credibility problem in the market. In second half 2016, the depreciation originally was more than 5%. So there were people who incurred a loss to solve this problem at the end of May 2017 with the central parity re regime. The... Um, uh, uh, one week uh, factor was introduced in order to achieve a better hedge. So in 2017, when foreign exchange is still uh, in shortage, RMB did not fall, but it appreciated by more than 6%. As a result, pol policy credibility problem was solved. And people at that time doubted that uh, RMB would depreciate below 7 or even 8. However, because for the whole year, RMB did not depreciate but it appreciated. So, in other words, um, the uh, market expectation uh, was um, defeated. So, we should not only rely on lip service. The authority must be persistent in maintaining stability of exchange rate. After 2017 till now, uh, the enterprises are educated so that they would not put a bet on single way appreciation or uh, depreciation of RMB, and then the uh, credibility of the policy was restored. And then we also need to pay attention to logic of policy and logic of the market. Both must be in line. So reference will be made to a basket of currencies to ensure stability of the exchange rate. But the market still doubted the st stable exchange rate policy because within China, enterprises cross-border uh, payment and receipt in terms of USD share in 2019 still 87%, almost 90%. So given such situation, the two-way uh, fluctuation between RMB and USD will cause a big impact on in enterprises. So if the policy and market logics are in line, then our policies will be uh, really effective. So that's why there was the reverse in 2017. That's my own opinion. So the credibility of central banks' uh, exchange rate policy was restored. You just said, you just referred to the managed floating system. So starting 20, 20, 2005, that is the last uh, exchange reform. And then after that, reference was taken from one basket of currencies and the managed floating system was put in place. Just now, Guan Tao said, well, it was said that there is a managed floating system, but over a long period of time, USD is still the major reference currency. So I think um, on the surface, it seems to be a basket of currencies. However, after some calculation, the two-way exchange rate is still most important. I want to ask another question. Now we talk about uh, managed floating system. So on the surface, it is in line with the logic. 
However, since the 811 uh, reform, or if you look at past policies, there is one point. The official stance is that there should be more flexibility in the exchange rate, but on the other hand, there should be stability in capital. And I think sometimes um, it's difficult to achieve both. So what is your own understanding? Whenever there is big appreciation or depreciation in our currency, it seems that the decision maker will be nervous. And uh, what? Why are, why are they nervous? I think in China, in terms of exchange rate policy, I think it reflects international society's consensus. Now, after the Asian financial crisis, people talked about what should be the right exchange rate system. And the consensus is that there is not one choice that can meet or satisfy all countries and everybody. So the choice of exchange rate system should be brought in definition. It includes policy as well as operation. So policy is fixed, relatively speaking. But then um, in different rates, there would be a different um, uh, policy operation. But then in China, after 1994, there was the managed floating system. And people have a lot of misunderstanding. In 2005, there was uh, the uh, one round of reform, and in 1994, there was this, uh, that was the start of managed floating system. 20 years afterwards, in August 2019, when RMB broke through seven, then, well, there was more market-oriented exchange rate. So under the managed floating system, we go for more flexibility in exchange rate policy. Why is it that decision makers are still nervous when there is big depreciation or appreciation? Why are they very sensitive about that? There are a few points. First, for the decision makers, in early 2018, they said to the external world that uh, Exchange rate policy should be neutral, but they have not explained further. My personal understanding is that neutral exchange rate policy is that the exact rate is not the most important. I think it is important to guard against excessive fluctuations. What do we mean by excessive fluctuation? If there is a big uh, loss of balance between supply and demand or if there is strong one-sided expectation. So when RMB appreciates, will that affect the competitiveness of export and, export and will that affect enterprises operation? Will that affect uh, foreign reserve and financial stability? Well, if so, then that is uh, abnormal or irregular uh, fluctu fluctuation. Then the uh, central bank should intervene. In 2019, in August, when RMB broke through seven, the flexibility of exchange rate increased a lot. Some market commentators said that exchange rate, RMB exchange rate, had uh, moved into a, an internal free floating uh, pattern. So when RMB only appreciated in the latest round, uh, PBOC uh, still exercised some adjustment and control because starting June last year till now, RMB continued to rise, and uh, up till now, when it comes to cross-border uh, receipts and payments, enterprises still have 90% of receipt of foreign currencies in USD. So the uh, two-way uh, fluctuation uh, still causes a lot of impact on enterprises. Enterprises may not be doing business or trade with the U.S., they may uh, do trade with non-U.S. countries, but then 90% of the transactions are denominated in USD. In 2009, there was cross-border RMB denomination approach, but then in the first half this year, RMB is only used in 50%, 15% of the cases. In 85% of the transactions, or more than 90%, um, USD is used for the denomination. As a result, 
even though RMB appreciation for two way is more than um, multi multilateral RMB appreciation. Well, from this sense, there is not much impact on China's export competitiveness. However, for enterprises, ninety percent of the uh, transactions are denominated in nine, in USD. So for the two way um, fluctuation uh, between RMB and USD. Well, that affects enterprises a lot. So as a result, the authority uh, decided to intervene. Now, for RMB appreciation and stability of exchange rate and raw material price uh, stability, these are uh, being viewed and discussed together. Guan Tao just corrected me. He said that managed floating system started in 1994. That was the official uh, saying instead of uh, 2005. Actually, let me explain my feeling. In the market, in 1997, during Asian financial crisis, well, actually, at that time, RMB is actually keeping a close eye on USD. So in 2005, we interpret that as a uh, restart of a uh, managed floating system. I have a strong memory of that. At that time, I am still in Citibank, and before I went to work in the morning, PBOC made an announcement of um, a rate at eight, and at that time, we worked uh, over time and so on. So what Guan Tao just said is true. In terms of policy, we started to have uh, that in 1994. You just talked about why the government is concerned. Well, it is for the sake of stability. Now I want to ask you, can you give a simple answer? Now, in the future, exchange rate will still see volatility. Sometimes the range of volatility is bigger, sometimes smaller. In the coming few years, if there is volatility, what kind of approach do you think the central bank or the government will use to stabilize the exchange rate? What will be the most possible tools? I think to the central bank, I think multi-pronged approach should be used. First, more market education. The market should be directed to have clearer understanding of risk management so that uh, a currency mismatch uh, can be kept under control. Exchange rates will not only go one side, there would be both appreciation and depreciation. So people should not be overly concerned about uh, appreciation or depreciation in exchange rates. Second, when necessary, there should be some measures to manage expectation. So we should observe whether there is some abnormality. At the end of May, the central bank immediately put in place measure to uh, manage expectation. So at that time, RMB tried to break through 6.4. And at that time, the uh, daily average transaction reached uh, 50.9 billion USD and the peak Comparing with the peak, is even 16% higher. 6th of May to 24th of May, the transaction volume was up 20%. So in the market, uh, there was panic selling of foreign currencies because of this RMB appreciation. As a result, the central bank uh, took action to manage the um, expectation. It doesn't want the expectation to be self-fulfilling. And then there should be more flexibility in the exchange rates. Just now, Professor Huang talked about the, the time between 1994 to 2005. And with the Asian financial crisis, well, RMB is being watched by many um, people. And in the early period, exchange rates moved less, and but then there was more control and management. In 2015, um, we went back to the real managed floating system. But still, things develop in stages. And there was pressure of a loss of balance.
in exchange rate. In the past 20 years, RMB did not experience depreciation. People had no psych psychological preparation about depreciation, so as a result, there is mismatch. When RMB depreciated, people allocated more to foreign assets. And so we have to increase flexibility in exchange rate to relieve pressure. Pressure should not be allowed to accumulate. In 2018, um, you can see that right now there is uh, the normal leveraging effect of exchange rate. And concerning is if effect to stabilize uh, macroeconomy, uh, we can gradually see the impact. And then when there is a loss of balance, in exchange rate, there is pressure, and uh, you, you can either do something with the price so that exchange rates will appreciate or depreciate as you want. If you don't want to see volatility, then you can intervene with foreign reserve. But then, if that is done, that would be impact. When it is, when it is a depreciation or an, an appreciation case, then the independence of, um, okay, in case of depreciation, foreign reserve adequacy may be affected. In case of appreciation, then there would be the um, doubt of um, manipulation or intervention. If there is oversupply uh, of foreign currencies, then uh, you can expand uh, outflow, and then you can also take macro measures to adjust or control um, the capital flow measure or pace. There is no one-size-fits-all situation. There may be uh, over or excessive adjustment, and if you control inflow, then the investment environment will be affected. If you expand outflow, whether or not we can make foreign investment does not depend on availability of foreign currencies. It is a matter of whether we have the capability of allocation of resources globally. Thank you. We only have two to three minutes left for this session. My last question is, I would like to see whether you can make a brief response. In the 14th five-year plan, there is this saying about uh, deepening RMB internationalization, and this is related to exchange rates. I don't know whether you can also answer the following point. In this round of RMB internationalization, comparing with the last round, what are the differences? Last time in 2009, well, effort has been made, and during 811 reform, uh, work has uh, been suspended, but if you do a comparison, comparison of the strategies, are there any differences? Today, I think uh, this uh, seminar is organized in Hong Kong. Concerning the offshore market of Hong Kong, will there be new opportunities again? Is there anything that can be done differently from the past? Thank you. For the 14th five-year plan, uh, there is the uh, statement of deepening RMB internationalization. And there is one difference from the last round. During 13th five-year plan, RMB internationalization is driven by policy. At that time, the degree of internationalization is lower, so there is the need to eliminate cross-border RMB use uh, policy barriers. So uh, things are more policy-driven. And in the 14th five-year plan, well, there is also the saying that there must be enterprise choice and market-driven uh, development. So more will be um, from the market. And comparing with the 13th five-year plan, I think uh, stability and sound development is given a lot of importance. So in the 13th five-year plan, a stable development uh, was um, emphasized. So in 14th five-year plan, concerning RMB internationalization, we have to do our own job well. I think that is the focus. It is more important to do a good job of economic transformation. If our economy is strong, then our currency will be strong, then RMB internationalization will succeed. We need to develop our financial markets with both breadth and depth and liquidity. With that, then we can support 
uh, RMB internationalization, and it will be more convenient for people to make allocation in RMB. So I think in the 14th five-year plan, more uh, emphasis is given to a market-led or market-driven development concerning opportunities to Hong Kong all along. Hong Kong has been an important offshore RMB center, and I have got some experience. So starting from 2009, when there was the pilot uh, scheme, then that, that was the start, and I myself experienced in 2014 in Hong Kong. Before that, uh, cross-border RMB flow was uh, through underground channels. But then uh, concerning Hong Kong, Hong Kong's RMB, personal RMB business, uh, that was the start of use of RMB in the banking system. In the next stage of RMB internationalization, definitely Hong Kong can play an important role. I think for RMB financial assets, I think Hong Kong should play a better role as an, a financial intermediary in terms of allocation of those assets because Hong Kong is a financial center and financial services are uh, a competitive edge of Hong Kong. So in the next stage of RMB internationalization, Hong Kong will continue to play an important role as an offshore center. And in terms of RMB assets, R&D and also supply, Hong Kong can continue to play a role. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Guan Tao. I have asked all my questions. Now we will move on to Q&A session. So I will pass the floor to Chen Hongyi to be the moderator for Q&A. Hongyi, are you online? Yes, yes, I will start now. Today, we have many online questions and we can also take questions on site. First question, CSOP Asset Management, CEO Ding Chen, please. Thank you. Thank you, AOF. Thank you, uh, Hong Yi. Thank you, Dr. Guan and Professor Huang. I'm very honored. During the pandemic, it is good that AOF can organize this high-level seminar on RMB exchange rate reform. And we have this um, talk by a main decision maker and participants. Now, okay, let me ask uh, Professor Huang a question. We are all participants in the capital market and some time ago, well, in the talk, you also said that RMB exchange rate experienced some volatility. And some time ago for tech stocks, especially in Hong Kong, there was adjustment to tech stocks and some foreign funds are uh, making an exit from Chinese tech stocks. As a result, there is a short-term exchange rate fluctuation. So if you look from regulators and policymakers' point of view, how will be the views? What will be the tolerance to this kind of sudden change in exchange rate? And today, in the market, tech stocks faced another uh, correction. So if there is further fluctuation in the capital market causing impact on exchange rates, uh, how much tolerance will the policymakers have? Will they uh, come in to intervene? Thank you. Ms. Ding, is your question for Professor Huang? Yes, yes, right. Professor Huang, then please answer the question. Right. Or oh, Dr. Guan, now PBOC, SEC, SCRC will definitely um, do more in regulation. Now, some time ago, because of adjustment and correction in the Chinese stocks, uh, exchange rates had once fell below 6.5, but in two to three days' time, uh, it recovered. The, the decline was recovered. So it is something short-term and transient. SERC on this matter, CSRC, because of the market shocks, 
and also overseas regulators had made policy adjustments. So uh, CSRC had made response. Safe PBOC did not uh, make any public response. So if you look from exchange rate policy's point of view, right now, they are not too much concerned about the exact rates change, but then they are more concerned about change in market reaction. If there is no excessive or irregular market reaction, then there may not be the need for uh, too much response. Actually, if you look at two-way fluctuations in RMB, it is a way to absorb external and internal shocks. So last year, you see typical example. In the first half, because of various factors, RMB exchange rate fell to 7.2. And then after that, uh, there was one-way uh, appreciation of RMB. So two-way fluctuations in exchange rates can absorb different types of shocks. Let's see whether Professor Huang have, uh, has anything to supplement. Just one point concerning the tech companies and also recent regulatory moves. My understanding is that the main direction supports innovation and development of uh, platform economy and digital economy. There is no problem. But in the past period in that area, there were some uh, unregulated approach. So I think the point is the regulator wants orderly development. And if everything can grow wealthy together, I think that is in line with the regulator's direction. So support for innov innovation, support for sustainable development of the industry, this broad direction will not change. But um, of course, they want the players to develop in a more regularized way. The government doesn't want to attack these platform companies. It is not true that the government doesn't want them to continue to do business. That's not the case. Second question. Uh, Dr. Wang Tao, Head of Asia Economics and Chief China Economist from UBS. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Huang and Dr. Guan. Just now, Dr. Guan Tao uh, gave, gave an explanation about exchange rate system and it has become more flexible. My question is simple. In the past two years, in relation to exchange rates and fund flow, there has not been any serious uh, shock. So my question is this. If cross-border capital flows experience big fluctuations for whatever reasons, then in terms of policies, do you think the policy will tolerate more flexibility ex in exchange rates or they will enhance regulation over cross-border capital flow? So at the end of the day, Which will be more dominant? Thank you. Okay, let me take your question and then Professor Huang can supplement. At present, the Chinese government is more confident to tolerate exchange rate fluctuations and more exchange rate fluctuations. At present, when there's inflow, Concerning expansion of outflow, there is still a lot, a long way. And then at the same time right now in the market, regarding two-way fluctuations of exchange rates, the market is now more adaptive already. So when there is expansion of exchange rate fluctuation, well, I think there are more favorable conditions for further expansion. But then uh, the financial markets need to be broader and deeper, especially uh, exchange rate market, then it can absorb more shocks. If there is this deep and broad exchange rate or foreign exchange market, then we will have more confidence. Okay, next question. Uh, Professor Huang, you want to supplement? Oh, I don't have anything to add. I agree with Dr. Guan. Okay. Right, the next question. 
Guotai Global Investments Limited Executive President Zhao Jiayin, please. Oh, Jiayin has left already. Okay. Jiayin has left already. Okay, next. Let's invite um, Dr. Xiao Hong, Managing Director, Chief Greater China Economist from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Thank you, Hong Yi, from inviting us to for inviting us to join this meaningful seminar. My question is for Dr. Guan and Professor Huang. On the 30th of July, in Politburo's meeting, it was said that macro policy autonomy should be strengthened so that there is a basic stability in RMB exchange rate within reasonable range. You said that exchange rate is actually an expectation of tightening of monetary policies of uh, two countries. We should not only pay attention to one industry in the future. If policies have lower relevance with Federal Reserve's policies, our autonomy is higher, then there would be more volatility in exchange rate. In that case, how can we ensure basic stability in exchange rates within a reasonable um, balance? How can you solve this uh, conflict? Thank you for the question, Dr. Tiao. On the 30th of July, during the Politburo's meeting, well, actually, it is a response to the market's concern. Now the market is worried. Some time ago, China's uh, foreign exchange policy was leading, and later on there was there would be tapering in the U.S., and then um, there would be greater pressure, and for uh, monetary policy stance, there would be change. There would be mismatch in monetary policy between U.S. and China, and given that backdrop, on the 30th of July, the Pol Politburo emphasized the importance of autonomy of macro policy. Given these circumstances, there would be the possibility of a divergence in U.S. and China's monetary policy. U.S. policies may be tighter, relatively. And then uh, USD may recover. That will affect RMB exchange rate. In other words, RMB may depreciate. Now, the authority <coughs> will insist on um, autonomy of uh, policy. Now, China is a big country, so I think we will give uh, more dominance to uh, domestic employment and domestic economic growth. When there was economic downturn and trade frictions with other countries, and Federal Reserve continued to hike interest rates a number of times, at that time, there's the need for independent monetary policy to stabilize growth. Right now, the uh, monetary mismatch has been uh, alleviated, and so there is more room for independence or autonomy in China's policy. So after 811, um, or actually, for more than 20 years, there was uh, one-way appreciation of RMB, so there is serious mismatch. In 2015, after two um, adjustments, then there was much improvement. So in 2018, RMB fell to seven, and then after that, it broke through seven, and then there were serious or big ups and downs. And I think the authority will not be uh, overwhelmed too much. For China, when there is depreciation pressure, I think China has accumulated some experience. Uh, China should be able to handle the situation well. Next question. Uh, Zhao Xie, please. From CPP Investments, Managing Director. Thank you for organizing this meaningful seminar. I, uh, it has been a long time since I participated in the last physical event. It was before the pandemic. Thank you, Hong Yi, for the invitation. Thank you, Professor Huang and Dr. Guan, for the excellent uh, sharing. I have learned a lot. I have one question for Professor Huang and Dr. Guan to us. Well, we are a long-term investor. When we invest in any country or region, we attach a lot of importance to 
not short-term equity price movements, but we attach more importance to systems and also enterprises' capabilities. So when it comes to exchange rate, my question is, with this round of uh, reform, what is the final goal? What is the final destination? And how far are we from the final destination? Thank you. Well, actually, about exchange rates in May, uh, Central Bank made two announcements. First, the stability policy will remain unchanged. So the second thing is the exchange rate fluctuation or managed floating system will remain unchanged now and in the future. So that's the official stance. I think that the final destination of the reform is uh, free, uh, free convertibility. If China goes for opening up capital accounts and RMB internationalization, and China is a big country and uh, monetary policy should be independent, then in that case, we can only choose uh, or go for exchange rate being market oriented. If we want to interfere with exchange rate, then that will affect uh, capital flow and independence of monetary policy will also be undermined. Well, we have a managed floating system, but in our exchange rate policy, we are shifting towards more flexibility. And to a large extent, we are like a, a quasi uh, free convertibility arrangement. So I personally think that we only lack a system, systemic announcement of free convertibility. That's my view. But of course, it is not something that can be achieved within a short period of time. In order to reach free convertibility, there is a lot to do. We need to further perfect the central parity mechanism. Now, during the interim period, with a managed floating, it is um, uh, conducive to having two-way fluctuations. But then, um, if exchange rate trend is determined by one single um, mechanism, then that may um, lead to one-way fluctuation more easily. And then uh, if there is free convertibility or free floating, then uh, the management arrangement should gradually uh, be phased out. Right now, if you look at the external market, we have already the ne necessary conditions. But if you look at the uh, products and transaction rules and so on, uh, there are still a lot of restrictions that need to be further relaxed. And the next point is about investor education. We need to educate market uh, participants and investors. So uh, this is a very systematic work process. So uh, that's all from me. Let's see whether Professor Huang has anything to add. No supplement from me. Next question. Professor Lin Chen, please, um, from Hong Kong U, Associate Dean, Chair of Finance. Uh, I'm very happy to listen to Dr. Guan's sharing. I'm happy to see uh, Ye Ping as well. Uh, Ye Ping today is, uh, has a difficult job. And at first he, uh, he should be a moderator, but now uh, he is also uh, sharing a lot of his views. So now I want to ask a question uh, from Dr. Guan related to CBDC. Concerning CBDC, What will be its function or impact on RMB internationalization? Will it replace or complement to the existing SWIFT system? What do you think? Thank you, Professor Lin, for the question. Concerning central bank digital currency, DCEP digital currency, well, Xiao Chuan, during Bo Ao Forum said that it is not really related to RMB internationalization. Well, central bank digital currency is only a payment tool. It won't change the situation about use of RMB internationally. So these two are not related. But when it comes to electronic payments, it may be related to RMB internationalization. 
because it involves the promotion of cross-border cooperation of payment system. But then if CBDC is used or whether or not uh, bank electronic currencies or third-party payment currencies are used, it is not important. The most important is internationalization of settlement uh, system. And when we talk about currency internationalization, will the official, will the government or will the market lead um, the um, settlement uh, system? So for Twig, it is not official, it is uh, oriented, market oriented. It is uh, issued or created by interbank organization. So when it comes to EP and its impact on RMB internationalization, I think uh, these two are more related. But for digital currency, it is not related to RMB internationalization. Based on the design of uh, central bank, it will replace some cash transaction for cross-border transactions. Well, there are a lot of uh, big, uh, big amount uh, transactions. I think Professor Huang is in a better position to answer this question because he has been examining this for a long period of time. I have nothing to add. I agree with Guan Tao a lot. For DCEP or ECNY, it is a retail-based currency in China. So first of all, if it is only a retail currency, it is difficult for it to be internationalized. Secondly, in the future, if it cannot be turned into a wholesale currency, then there would be a lot of constraints. At this present moment, I can't see any actual help to RMB internationalization, but within a small scope, well, I think in Hong Kong, for example, uh, ECNY can be uh, used in an experimental way, but then for cross-border cross, cross -border payments, I think there may be some possible attempts, but still, uh, there is still a long way to go. Right, next question. Uh, Dr. Wan Tian from International Finance Corporation of World Bank Group. Thank you, Hong Yi. Uh, thank you, Hong Kong MA. Th uh, thank you, uh, AOF and Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Research. Thank you, Professor Huang and Dr. Guan. I have a question. Just now, Professor, Guang, uh, Professor Huang said that at the end of the day, RMB or any currency is about asset allocation in the broadest sense. If you look at China's balance sheets, well, for uh, foreign assets, a lot are foreign reserve, mainly U.S. Treasury. So it is a low return asset allocation. However, if we look at foreign asset allocation in China, they are uh, FDI dominated. And the rate of return is quite high, around 5.5% yield. So the asset yield um, is a negative uh, rate uh, to us. So have we considered expanding household and corporates um, direct investment, foreign direct investment? Is there a uh, specific timetable or roadmap? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wan, for your question. I think your observation is very accurate. China, if you look at our balance sheet, it is because of the structure of foreign uh, investments, which is uh, mainly based on U.S. Treasury, which is a low return uh, asset allocation. So when it comes to the next step, when we expand the uh, two-way opening up of capital account, this is the uh, big trend, and it is going to be integrated with our going abroad approach. And we are making a lot of attempts. In 2014, when there is the stock connect, or where that is one direction, there is both northbound and also southbound uh, stock connect. So um, some good experience is given to us for reference. At first, people were worried. Domestic RMB assets have higher valuation, so asset price is relatively higher after opening up. Will there be 
capital outflow, but then with the Hong Kong Stock Connect so far, the accumulated purchase is no more than 2% of the total. So there is no big outflow. I think this is an experience we can take reference from. However, how to expand uh, opening up? So far, there is no timetable or roadmap. I think that within the short period of time, that would be opening up in the form of channels. So there won't be a uh, free arrangement overnight. It will be a limited way of opening up. And uh, with uh, more flexibility in exchange rates, uh, the authority will rely less on uh, control on um, capital. So we want to expand opening up so that households' diversified asset allocation can increase. And in this way, when there is aging population, well, recurrent account may see deficit instead of surplus. If we expand opening up now, then we will be like Japan. So our foreign asset allocation may get enough return, then that can offset trade uh, deficits. So that's all from me. I would like to add a point. Now, in China, there has been a lot of discussion about this, and many scholars said, that China's international payment, balance of payment, is that we are not profitable, so we need to change. We, If we take China and U.S. as an example, our foreign investments are mainly in U.S. treasuries, and U.S. investment are in the form of FDI, so their return is high, our return is low. So many scholars recommended a change. My view is more pessimistic. So what form of investment can give us higher return? I think this is an overall management quality uh, determination. When Chinese go out to make direct investment, I don't think they necessarily can get high return. There is a lot of FDI that does not give us high return. When you go overseas, it depends on whether you have stronger management capability and marketing capability if you want to really make high return. And uh, so far, we have not got such a scenario yet. Whenever there is fluctuation, people will say that re f foreign reserve should be adjusted. We should not invest so much. But then I think that our foreign reserve is like an insurance. It is, uh, its aim is not to generate a return. If this is adjusted, then I think uh, an improvement in return is something systemic. It is not about whether we have invested too much or too less in FDI, it is not as, sim as simple as that. Next question. Uh, Ms. Sun Lu from uh, Goldman Sachs Asia. Thank you, Dr. Guan Tao. Thank you, Professor Huang and Hong Yi for allowing me to ask questions. Today, Dr. Guan talked about the trend of RMB versus USD. Detailed Explanation has been given. I have a question on RMB versus a basket of currencies. This year, RMB versus USD showed two-way fluctuation. But against a basket of currencies, if you look at CFATs, it is a continuous appreciation, almost up 4% since the beginning of this year. And after a lowering of RRR, uh, still there is appreciation against the basket of currencies. If you look at New Zealand or emerging markets, there has been appreciation already. So Dr. Guan, what do you think of the continuous appreciation between RMB and the basket of currencies? Will this continue if there is continuous appreciation? Now, RMB against the basket of currencies exceeded 98, already higher than the 2018 peak. From the regulator's point of view, RMB rate is referenced against the basket of currencies. So with this appreciation, will the regulator uh, respond in any way? Thank you. Recently, after the lowering of RRR, RMB continued to appreciate against the basket of currencies. It is because of the market supply and demand. As a result, RMB appreciated. As you all know, 
we still have a surplus in trade for direct investment it is a net inflow so even though there is two-way fluctuations in RMB overall speaking there is uh, more supply over demand externally so with the central parity mechanism there are two parts one market relationship to financial international financial market so starting from 9th of July to uh, 16th August the central parity price or if you look at the closing rate and the intermediate rate is up 65 basis points and within this range there is 38 basis points contributing 80 percent so in other words the market supply and demand has caused much impact on RMB fluctuation or appreciation and USD has been stable during that period so against major trading partners RMB has been appreciation appreciating that's one important factor besides as you said now uh, the exchange rate exceeded 98 already central bank is exchange rate neutral or oh, well, that is not official statement it is my view so they are not concerned about the exact rate no matter whether we are talking about uh, bilateral or multilateral rates so some time ago there was a uh, speculation in the market saying that uh, RMB between 92 to 96 would be more comfortable to central bank but if you, it breaks through 96 it is too strong then central bank will intervene now we are at 98 in May and June uh, there was a round and then uh, there was some uh, control and adjustment but then so far after that there has not been a strong uh, statement made by the central bank so in the process it all depends on whether there are excessive reactions in the market when there are two-way fluctuations there are divergent market expectations external market external supply and demand has improved since 9th July to 16th August in the interbank market the daily average daily transaction 360 but then uh, back then uh, there was 390 so there is a uh, decrease by around 10 percent so that means that in the market there was no one way excessive reaction and as a result central bank will just uh, keep a close eye to the change and when you look at the two-way or bilateral exchange rate we should not only look at the absolute level we need to look at the duration within which the change has happened since June last year till now RMB exchange rate or RMB exchange rate index went up uh, 60 odd percent within one year after considering inflation it is smaller so based on International Settlement Bank or Clearance Bank in June last year to June this year RMB rose 2.8 percent so affecting competitiveness of export we should not look at the absolute level we need to look at the duration we have to also look at the real um, change instead of only the nominal rate because of time we will now take the last two questions Dr. Er Zhi Huan from Bank of China Hong Kong thank you Hong Yi for giving me this rare chance thank you Dr. Guan Tao for the explanation and Professor Huang's highlights I have gained a lot thank you well many questions have been asked already let me ask a very simple question because of time constraints from 2015 after the exchange rate reform six years have passed and there have been two complete cycles 6.4 down to 7 and then in 2018 back to 6.4 and in 2019 at 7.2 now 6.4 so since the reform in the past six years from our observation I think it seems that there is a range 6.4 to 7 and then 7.2 something like a range So in policymakers' mind, is it true that 
there is a tolerable range. So at 6.4, that would be pressure on trade. At 7.2, then there will be capital flow concerns, right? That's what you said. Now, RMB exchange rate has been adjusted based on USD fluctuations in the future. When RMB internationalization is enhanced in the future, should Southeast Asian currencies be considered more? They, um, their currencies are smaller, but then uh, they are also looking at changes in RMB. So what do you think, Dr. Guan? First question. Does the central bank have a reasonable range from 6.4 to 7.2? I need to say that I am not the right person to speak on behalf of the central bank, but my personal opinion is that there is no such a range. There is no theory basis because when it comes to impact on uh, export competitiveness, uh, it is a, more about a bilateral exchange rate or multilateral exchange rate. And in the change process of exchange rates, is there any big impact on market behavior and market expectation? If the change happens over a longer period of time, then market expectation may affect less the market behavior. If it is big fluctuation within short period of time, then there may be some impact. However, up till now, from central, point, central bank's operation point of view, we cannot say that there is a tolerable range from 6.4 to 7.2. Your next question is about uh, other neighboring countries. Can RMB play a role within um, regional cooperation? Before the uh, global financial crisis in 2008, there was such discussion saying that Asia should uh, strengthen, a, a strengthen monetary uh, cooperation like what Europe had done. So RMB and other currencies, there should be more cooperation. Yes, there has been discussion at that time, but now there is less such discussion. The most important point is that in the past few years, China's economic growth was fast. China's market potential has been gradually realized. So there is more and more frequent um, contact and trade, uh, trade flow with other countries. So RMB's role is rising. RMB's re relevance is rising vis-a-vis uh, -vis other neighboring Asian countries. Now USD and RMB trend is not in parallel so there is more flexibility in rmb exchange rate rmb's importance in the region uh, is now higher in status but will there be really a cooperation mode or model yes there can be some discussion but comparing with 10 odd years ago well now there is less discussion and i have not given a lot of thoughts to that myself i will not rule out this as an option because of time. Uh, last question. Okay, I think Jia Yin has come back. Uh, we will pass the floor to her. She is Executive President of Guotai Global Investments Limited. Thank you. I stepped out just now. Um, I hope that my question has not been asked. Uh, Dr. Guan, when you answered uh, Professor Huang's last question, can you elaborate a bit? I am from Guotai uh, Fund, and our fund company would like to get some views from the two of you. In recent year, uh, months and in the coming three to five years, if you look at exchange rate change and RMB internationalization, can you give us some advice about overseas investment, including USD and offshore RMB asset allocation? Can you give us some advice, please? Thank you. Ms. Zhao, thank you for your question. In the future, for medium to long term, RMB exchange rate flexibility will increase. RMB internationalization will steadily continue. Capital markets will be more open. Over the long run, China's capital flow is being um, strictly managed. So 
when it comes to opening up of capital market, I think there will be more room to uh, increase outflow. So for fund companies, overseas business uh, plan, I think there will be some impact. Based on my understanding now, in order to face up to current exchange rate fluctuation, more market-oriented approaches should uh, be taken. So, uh, i.e. to increase outflow, QD, II, LP, and so on, I think that would be more convenient to the application for such quota. And then the state authority will support those strong um, uh, domestic financial institutions to make uh, business development overseas, including securities companies, fund companies, those um, that are strong enough, those with necessary conditions. I think uh, the policies will be more relaxed and convenient. For fund houses, well, you need to enhance product R&D capability and uh, management and also investor education. As you all know, I do agree with Professor Huang. Can we invest overseas? It is not true that you will definitely be profitable if you invest overseas. I think the more important thing is whether you have the ability to make the right asset allocation overseas. Over the long run, Chinese investors have been given too much protection, so they have not enough understanding about risk overseas. So they won't say anything if, you, if they make money, but if they incur a loss, well, they will be overwhelmed and so on. So I think there must be enough investor education. If we can enhance our capability, if we can give uh, the right education and guidance to investors, if we can control risk well, uh, then we will be able to uh, enjoy longer and bigger success. Thank you, Professor Huang and Dr. Guan. Uh, because of time, there are still a lot of online questions that cannot be asked uh, here and now. Thank you very much for your enthusiastic participation. Uh, we will conclude our seminar here. Thank you.